Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on General Admission Sports. Now, this video is a little bit different than most of the videos that we put out on this channel. Um, for three reasons, I'm going to do this video. It's about the NFL playoffs that just happened, the wild card round that just happened this past weekend. I'm doing this video for three reasons. Number one, uh, I'm super busy this week with my real job, so I, need, I, I just wanted to do a, a video, and this is a little bit quicker uh, than some of the other videos that I do. Um, number two is I want, I, I realize that I haven't really, uh, put my own opinions out there very much. Um, just in terms of, you know, if you were going to say, Hey, what is, what does Griff think about, you know, the, the new England Patriots or something in general? Um, this is my chance to, to answer that question and show you kind of where my opinions are about some of these types of things. And third, and the most important reason is there's a million and a half of these videos reacting to the NFL playoffs and doing whatever. But I think what's really important about YouTube and about this particular forum is that there's a comment section. We get to have a conversation. So if you watch Colin Coward, if you watch Jason Whitlock, which I do, and I like listening to them, but I can't really have a conversation with them. You know, they, they say their, their piece to me. And if I disagree, then I disagree. And so the best I can do is try to re-articulate their argument to someone else and then argue against it. Um, but in, in this particular situation, I'll have an opinion that I'm sure people out there will disagree with. And so I would encourage you to go to the comments. Don't, you, don't just dislike the video. Just go to the comments and tell me why. And if you know any of my videos, you know that I respond to all the comments. So, you know, it should be easy to, uh, to have a, a conversation. Um, so, so let's start with the two games that I find least interesting, just in terms of storyline, and then work our way up. So first of all, uh, Bills, Texans, we'll start with that. Full disclosure, I was bowling while this goes on, shooting my, you know, bowling my solid 90 a game or whatever it is. I suck at bowling. Um, but I was, I was doing that while this game was going on, uh, and so I only made it back for the fourth quarter in OT, and I know I didn't miss much. <laughs> you know, I was, I was watching it out of the corner of my eye. And, you know, the Bills are a fun story. The Texans are a cool story. Uh, the only thing I'll say is Deshaun Watson is much better in the NFL than I thought he would be. So credit to him, credit to Bill O'Brien. I don't really think the Texans have that much of a chance, even though they beat Kansas City. They're going to Kansas City in a playoff atmosphere. You know what? Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of talking my way out of this. They beat Kansas City earlier this year. Yes, the Chiefs had some injuries. But also, the Chiefs, I believe, are 1-7 in, in their last eight home playoff games, and they lost to the Titans uh, two years ago. So, yeah, the, the, the Texans may have a chance here, and I do like them. They, they got some pieces that I like. Uh, but overall, the game was not particularly interesting in terms of story. I don't follow the Bills very closely. Um, they're just fun. You know, it's fun when, when a small market team does good things. So, I think the Bills will get better. Josh Allen will get better. Um, so, they're going to be fun. The other one that I didn't care so much about is the Vikings and Saints, and I only say that for one reason, is because these kind of doomsday predictions about the Saints, which we'll get to when it comes to the Patriots, but specifically when it comes to the Saints, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I, th I, I think a couple things can be true. I think this Drew Brees can be old, and he is old. I mean, he'll he'll he's 40. He'll be 41 by the time the next NFL season starts if he does come back, which it looks like he will. Um, so yes, he's older. He's losing a step. So that is true. But also, is he washed up? No, I don't think he's washed up. Did he have a terrible game? Uh, no, I, I I don't think he had, I don't think he had a terrible game. I mean, here's the reality. He went 26 for 33, 208 yards and a touchdown. And then, of course, he did throw, he threw a pick and then he fumbled. So he makes two turnovers. But when was the last time we ever just destroyed a quarterback for two turnovers? I mean, yeah, he made some turnovers. Yeah, it wasn't great. But also, the defense probably should have done a bit better of a job than they did. Um, specifically in the middle of the game, in that second and third quarter, uh, the Vikings just looked much better. They just looked like a better team. And then, you know, they gave up a 50-yard ball over the top to Kirk Cousins. So, I, I, you know, I don't have a ton of sympathy for the defense. I'll say for Drew Brees, is he washed up? No, he's not washed up. If you look at his numbers, he's absolutely not washed up in the least. Is Taysom Hill the real deal as far as, like, a utility player? Absolutely. This kid, I mean, I really like him. I liked him in college. I don't think he got a fair shake because of the injuries. 
But look, he completed a pass for 50 yards. He had four rushes for 50 yards. And then, of course, he caught a touchdown as well, I believe. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he caught a touchdown. And he, uh, he had a 25 yards uh, receiving. So he accounted for 125 yards in the game and a touchdown. Look, this kid's really good, and he's very lucky that he's under Sean Payton, who's a brilliant offensive mind, to really bring the most out of him. And there are more coaches like that now. I think Sean Payton, you've got Kyle Shanahan, I think Sean McVay, Andy Reid. There are lots of coaches that could really get the best out of Taysom Hill. And then, of course, you have uh, Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma. If he were to make ju the jump to the NFL, would see a lot of value in Taysom Hill. And what I like about him is he represents the pathway into the league for these types of quarterbacks that uh, that aren't NFL-ready throwers, but they still have a lot to offer. So if you remember, uh, if you remember Troy Smith from Ohio State, he won the Heisman in 2005, maybe I want to say that sounds a little bit early. He won the Heisman in 2006. I just looked it up, um, but he didn't really get a shot to make it in the NFL because of course at that time we were all talking about you know it was it was the traditional pro style quarterback is who worked so you know he did he he got some starts he got some game time obviously uh, because he was talented but if he had played today with his level of athleticism um, yeah I think he I think he would have had uh, more of a role on an NFL team I think today um, he's not the athlete that Taysom Hill is and there are athletes in college right now at the quarterback position that can really find their footing with a Taysom Hill type role. And at the same time, Lamar Jackson doing what he's doing, uh, I think you have more of a door open for athletic running quarterbacks out of college into the NFL than you've ever had. With all that being said, is Taysom Hill better than Drew Brees? Of course not. And I thought anyone making the argument that Taysom Hill should 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 replace Drew Brees. I thought they were making it ironically. If you weren't making it ironically, stop. <laughs> that's just, that's ridiculous. No one, no one in their right mind thinks that Taysom Hill is actually a better NFL quarterback, a guy that can throw 35, 40 times a game better than Drew Brees. Come on, you're, you're kidding yourself. Um, let's move on to the second most interesting game of the weekend was the Seattle Seahawks uh, overcoming the Philadelphia Eagles 17 to nine. Now, two stories here. Number one, DK Metcalf. He fell to the second round in the draft, and of course, he was a big social media story because you know he looked like he looked like a god. You know when he when he gets to the combine in uh, the combine in terms of his body, um, and you had a lot of people on social media saying, "Oh my God, this guy's going to be incredible!" And he had these fantastic plays at at uh, Ole Miss. But then you had all the pundits saying, "Well, just because he looks like that doesn't make him a good NFL receiver." Look, both were correct. If you look like that, if you have that level of speed and that and that level of athleticism, you're going to be good in the NFL. But also, you're not going to be good in the NFL just because you have that. There are tons of great, fantastic athletes that didn't make it in the league. With all that being said, my issue is I think now we're treating the first round of the NFL draft more like it's free agency than a draft. And by that I mean you expect to find guys in the first round that are going to come in on day one and be a Pro Bowl level starter or at least a high-end NFL level starter. And look, if you're drafting in the top 10, fair enough. Okay, I think the 10 best players in college, some years is less than that could actually be that level of NFL player early on. But if you're not, does that mean you're a failure? No, it absolutely doesn't, because who are we talking about? We're talking about 21 and 22 year old kids coming out of college. I mean, we talk about how much higher level the NFL game is than the college game. So then for guys making that transition, shouldn't we be saying, hey, look, we don't expect them to be perfect early on. And DK Metcalf is an example of that. He's 17 games into his pro career, okay? And you had a lot of people saying, well, he slid out of the first round because he's not a polished route runner. Okay, well, can you show me, like, the most, can you show me a guy who you would say that is a polished NFL-ready route runner from day one, the day he gets in the league? There's, like, one of those guys a year. You can teach route running. You can't teach size. You can't teach speed. You can't teach instincts. DK Metcalf has all of that. So you're telling me that a team 
like the Pittsburgh Steelers, like the New England Patriots, who we'll get to. There are so many teams, and you're telling me that not one of them in the first round thought we could use this kid. Once he gets past 20, you're like, oh, hey, I, you know, I know we had this guy on our board, but you have to draft best available when you have a guy who is a potential top 10 level guy who's now fallen past pick 20. You just have to pick best available at that point. The Seahawks did that when they got him in the second round, and look what he's become. Now, one game doesn't make a career. Metcalf may never surpass what we've seen in this one game, but what we've seen in this one game is enough for me to say this guy is an NFL-level receiver. He is a, he is in His ceiling is an elite-level receiver. You can teach him route running, and it's clear that he's gotten better when it comes to route running, but you can't teach things like DK Metcalf does. You can't teach the size that he has, but you can't look at that jump ball at the very end of the game to seal it for Seattle, which by the way, the play call to go deep in that situation when it was still a one possession game, that is ballsy. But the hops that he got to get up there and play the ball, you can't teach that. A guy comes out of college with that. So to me, you should be drafting a guy that has all of the stuff that you can't teach, all of the intangibles. And if you look at a guy who's raw, I mean, that's where that term comes from, is a guy you say, he's got everything that we want, we just have to teach him. And Metcalf, to me, seemed like that guy. So credit to Seattle, their entire team seems to be made up of guys that they said they've got, they've got the intangibles, we'll teach him the rest. Because if you look at their team, you've got third rounder Russell Wilson, second rounder DK Metcalf. You used to have fifth rounder Richard Sherman, who became an all pro because of because Seattle took a chance on him. You have Bobby Wagner and KJ Wright, who I'm pretty sure were fourth rounders, I want to say. And then the guys that weren't, guys like Jadavion Clowney, they picked him up. <laughs> they didn't even draft him. So uh, Metcalf, Metcalf, I think, is going to be good for, for a number of years. What I really wanted to talk about here is the New England Patriots. You are fooling yourself. If you came into this playoffs and thought New England is by far the best team in the AFC, okay, Um, I don't, I will make, you know, I always make exceptions for people that are fans of teams because I do it too. I'm a huge fan of UCLA. I'm I'm sure you've heard me say. And so uh, I'll make exceptions for people that, that like to look at the good of their team and, and, you know, not make excuses for it, but kind of rationalize the bad. I do understand that, but at some point you need to have a level of objectivity. So when it comes to UCLA, when us fans go into the football season uh, this year, none, none of us as fans were saying, yep, UCLA is, is a true contender in the Pac-12. They are going to uh, potentially compete for college football playoff spot. No true fan is actually saying that because you have to have a level of objectivity. The Patriots are at that point. Every fan had to be going into this playoffs thinking, even if you're looking at the team in the best possible light, you had to be thinking, uh, it's not looking great considering the offensive power that comes with teams like the Baltimore Ravens or the Kansas City Chiefs. But what you got from the New England Patriots on Saturday was even worse than I had imagined. I picked the Titans to win that game as much as I really like Derrick Henry. And I really, really like what the Titans are doing as a team in terms of putting a squad together. I still didn't think they had what it took, and the Patriots are almost unbeatable at Foxborough uh, in the playoffs. But what you saw out there was an old-ass Tom Brady who was missing throws. Okay, he's doing his quick release thing, which he's been doing for years. Fine, you know, you're older, you're trying to protect yourself. But he's missing throws. He's even making bad judgments at times, which Tom Brady rarely ever does. And... A defense that, as a result, got tired in its top five defense in the league, and they got tired, and this is what Derrick Henry does to you, and he just runs down your throat all day. Derrick Henry was the star, and the Titans had a perfect game plan. This is how they beat Tom Brady, and by the way, I absolutely love Mike Vrabel doing that trick with with uh, a delay of game and then multiple penalties uh, to chew up what ended up being about two minutes off the clock, because... Bill Belichick did it earlier this year, and you know that Mike Vrabel earned, learned that from Bill Belichick. So I absolutely love that from Vrabel. A little bit of poetic justice there, because Belichick has been taking advantage of those types of rules his entire career. As well, he should, because the rules are there. I mean, they're legal. Uh, so every coach should know them. Uh, when it comes to Tom Brady, though, look, I think I think Belichick is going to continue coaching 
uh, be, mostly because I think he's a robot that was that was manufactured specifically to coach NFL football. Um, as far as Tom Brady goes, though, he's he's at a bit of a crossroads right now. Yes, he's 43 years old. Can he still play uh, at an NFL level at the quarterback position? Yeah, I think so. I think he can. What what level of NFL level? Meaning, is he going to play like? I don't want to say Ryan Tannehill because because the guy's now in the divisional round of the NFL playoffs. But is he gonna is he gonna be at the at the Ryan Fitzpatrick level, or is he going to be at the Tom Brady level of old? You know, no no one really knows because every football season is different. But here's the thing for Tom Brady: he has decisions to make. He's already said that he's not going to take a pay cut. Uh, to play in New England, which, you know what, fine. He spent his entire career taking pay cuts so that New England can pay other guys, specifically on the defensive side of the ball. So if anyone, he's earned the right to say, I want one more contract, and and if a team is going to give it to him, you know, more, more power to him. I don't mind. But if he's not going to do that, then either he's going to essentially extort Robert Kraft for this nostalgia and, and Kraft's desire to hang on to Tom Brady in this dynasty, which may push, push Belichick away, or he's going to have to leave and go somewhere else where a team says, we're just one quarterback away from competing for a Super Bowl. That is a massive risk, okay? Whatever you think about Tom Brady, here is the reality. If he goes somewhere else and he doesn't play well, it completely opens the door to say that the Patriots dynasty for 20 years was Bill Belichick. And Tom Brady would, and you have all these people that already say that Tom Brady is a system quarterback, but that would open up the door to say, yes, Tom Brady is a system quarterback. It was Belichick's system that made him great. Do I believe that 100%? No, no. Tom Brady is an elite quarterback, obviously. I think anyone with an objective view can look at it and say, yes, Tom Brady is an, is an elite quarterback in the history of the NFL. But how elite? Because if he bows out right now, then it's it's almost impossible to look at it and say he's not the greatest quarterback that ever played the game. Because a quarterback is so intertwined with team success that winning six Super Bowls, you, that's that's your argument. If you're if you're a New England fan, justifiably, you're saying Tom Brady's the greatest ever. He's won six Super Bowls. Okay, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say to you there. He's a top three in almost all the in all the major uh, quarterback stats. I don't really know what to say. But if he goes to somewhere like, let's say, the Chargers, who I, I, I think, now I'm not an NFL insider, I'm just some guy, all right? But I think the Chargers seem to be a viable option for Tom Brady. If he goes there and he doesn't play well, Oh my God, you've got all of the fans coming out going, you see, I told you what he was. We knew what Tom Brady was and, and saying all these things. Now, Tom Brady may not care at all about his legacy going forward. He may not. He's got, the dude's got everything. He's got six Super Bowl rings. He's got, he's got an unbelievably gorgeous wife who makes more money than he does. He's got more money than, than anyone could ever want in their entire life. Dude's got everything. He, he may not care what his legacy is. On the flip side, he may very much care what his legacy is. And if he does, I would say to him right now, do not, do not leave New England. And don't leave Belichick. If Belichick leaves, retire immediately. Because if you care at all about your legacy, you hang it up right now. Because then people will say, he tried to push it one more year, he just couldn't go. But in his prime, the guy was the greatest quarterback of all time and it would be almost impossible to argue with. But if you leave and you don't play well, and God forbid Belichick stays the Patriots and they make the playoffs. That is the end of your legacy, my man. Because that is everybody second guessing and saying, is Tom Brady really as good as we thought he was this whole time? The argument against that would be, well, he's 44 years old. So of course he's gonna be slow. But by leaving, you are saying, you are putting yourself out there and saying, I believe that I am good enough to win games at an NFL level, no matter what my age is. So if you put that out there and then you can't, you sh you are going to be and you should be judged based on that decision. It's a massive risk for Tom Brady when it comes to his legacy if he does decide to leave the New England Patriots and go elsewhere, especially if Belichick stays at New England. So I'm going to be very intrigued to see what the Patriots do moving forward. It's well documented that Belichick uh, didn't think that Brady was going to have uh, this many years left in him. And I think if it was up to Belichick, he probably would have moved on from Tom Brady 
uh, after last season, probably, if not before then. Um, B- Belichick is not sentimental, at least outwardly. I think he would have moved on from Brady in a second if he thought there was someone else out there that could win uh, Super Bowls. Robert Kraft, on the other hand, is much more sentimental. And so it seems like that he will stick with Tom Brady. And so maybe Kraft will make the decision that he will give the money that Brady wants. He'll give him, I mean, at this point, depending on what Dak gets, Brady might be up in that $35 million range. And so Kraft might make the decision that he'll give him that. And if he does, I think you are handing a one-way plane ticket to Bill Belichick out of Foxborough. I think he is done if you bring Brady back for that amount of money. If you tell Belichick, we're getting him for one year, he's going to start for one more year, but you have free reign to draft whoever you want in the first round of the NFL draft. Pick a quarterback you want, and we will go get that guy. If they say that, that's enough to keep Belichick. If they don't, Belichick is gone if they bring Tom Brady back. That, that's my prediction. Again, I'm just some guy. So that is a great segue for me to say. If you disagree with any of that, let me know in the comments. I hope that you already have. You know that if you watch me, I do respond to the comments. Um, so, you know, just in, instead of disliking the video, tell me why or dislike the video and just tell me why you did it. I don't I don't really care, but I love doing stuff like this mostly because of the conversation. I don't expect anybody to watch this video and have their minds changed by what some random guy thinks on YouTube. But I, what I do want is just to have a conversation with people that hopefully believe things a lot different than me. Because what's cool is, you know, from where I live, and I'll, and I'll just tell you right now, so I live in Colorado, people here hate Tom Brady. I mean, that's just a fact. So if I walk around and have a discussion about Tom Brady, you pretty much know what you're going to get because, you know, people here are Broncos fans. They hate, they hate Tom Brady. Um, but if one of you guys out there is from Boston, you have a completely different uh, you know, view of Tom Brady and where he's at right now uh, in his career. And so I would love to hear from you and, and hear your thoughts on that. Um, that's the most fun part of doing something like this. So uh, this is a bit longer video than I wanted it to be, but you know, I think, uh, I think we can have some good discussion. So thank you so much for watching. Subscribe for all of GA Sports content now and in the future. We'll see you next time. We appreciate you. I'm in love with the way that you